But we're going to spend the last portion of today's uh, podcast talking with two green candidates from New Jersey who are running for governor and lieutenant governor as a ticket. And one is Madeline Hoffman, who is up in your, you got the same screen I do, upper right-hand corner. No. Yeah, upper right-hand corner. And Heather Warbarton for lieutenant governor, who's at the bottom of the screen. So let's have them uh, introduce themselves, talk about the campaigns, and then we'll deal with questions and answers. So welcome and thank you for coming and take it away, Madeline. Uh, thank you, Howie. Thank you for having us. I, I'm trying to minimize the impact of the sun on my screen, but it doesn't seem to be working as well as I would like. Um, <clears throat> so yes, Heather Warburton and I are running for governor in the state of New Jersey. The elections are November 2nd, so we don't have, we have but 17 days left to go. And we are working very, very hard to get our message out. Um, and that message includes some of the things you've been talking about, Howie, from the issue of grassroots democracy uh, to the issue of the Green New Deal or an eco-socialist Green New Deal uh, because Governor Murphy has adopted exactly the same um, goals as Joe Biden, um, saying that we would get to 50% um, renewable energy by 2030 and 100% by 2050. But I want to start, I'm going to talk a little bit about grassroots democracy because we had just finished the last uh, gubernatorial debate in New Jersey. There will only be two that are sanctioned by the Election Law Enforcement Commission. And they set up uh, a threshold of, get this, $490,000, just shy of half a million, to qualify for participation in the debates. So uh, neither I nor the other two independents running for governor in New Jersey could get anywhere near the qualification level. Um, and we didn't want to in the sense that in order to get $490,000, we'd probably have to play footsie with some special interests and people know the Green Party doesn't do that. So I participated or stood outside the debate venue uh, this past Tuesday, Rowan University in South Jersey, dressed up as a $490,000 bill. Um, and they still wouldn't let me in. I, I, I had my money. I, I wanted to be allowed in, but they still wouldn't let me in. And so all the issues that we care about, whether it's single payer health care, whether it's uh, overdevelopment and gentrification and housing those who don't have places a place to live, or implementing uh, tuition-free college across the board, or forgiving student student loan debt, or extending and canceling, um, extending the moratorium on evictions, but more than that, canceling rents and canceling mortgages from the past 19 months of uh, pandemic life in the United States. All of those issues, we don't have we don't have a voice. You see those two the Republican and Democrat go back and forth, saying nothing, exchanging barbs, but no real policies are put, are put forward. The Green Party has multiple policies to put forward. We're also concerned about the, the so-called cannabis legalization in New Jersey and the fact that um, there's no home grow, there's no automatic expungement of people's records, and it's not doing uh, the current law that was recently passed is not making up for the decades, decades of discrimination in uh, application of drug policy that has led to more African Americans being incarcerated um, than before. Um, and we want a true legalization policy, uh, and we want it to actually provide the restorative justice that it was supposed to provide. Um, there, um, until we get the big money out 
until we level the playing field, until we have ranked choice voting, which we've been calling for as well here in New Jersey, until those measures are put into place, uh, we still have people, you know, explaining to us how a vote or explaining to the public, a vote for a green is the same as a vote for whichever of the two candidates you don't want in. In fact, we are getting, we're getting attacked from both right and left this time. It's a little bit different than before where we'd only get attacked by the Democrats. Now we're getting attacked by the Republicans. I assume it's because they think this is a close race. Um, this is the only other gubernatorial race in the United States beside the one in Virginia. We've cross endorsed uh, Princess Blanding from Virginia, who's also been shut out of debates and is trying to get her voice heard throughout the state of Virginia. Um, our voices are being heard and they're being attacked. And that just makes us even more determined to keep pushing forward on the kinds of policies that, that the Green Party is all about. And I, I think I'll leave it there for the moment. There are specifics on other policies, but if people have questions, they can ask um, as time proceeds. And I'll let uh, I'll give the floor to Heather to uh, compliment compliment me with an E the way she has, <laughs> the way she has throughout the entire campaign. Uh, you, that was great. Um, but what Madeline didn't actually do was introduce herself. She oh. jumped right into policy. So I'm going to do that for her because that's part of what I wanted to say was I had no intention of running for lieutenant governor this year. That was not on my agenda. But when Madeline asked me, I guess it was back in maybe like March or so, I think she asked me, I could not say no to her because I have so much respect for Madeline. She has been a peace activist and a climate activist for decades. Like she is, you know, has been in it since the very beginning of these movements. I've seen the activism. She is out in the streets constantly fighting for clean water, for clean food, for Palestinian rights, for, um, you know, defunding the police for all these things. She's marched out in the streets. So I could not say no when she asked me. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm running for Lieutenant Governor this year is because Madeline asked me to, and I could not say no. <laughs> as far as who I am a little bit, I'll introduce myself. I'm an artist and an activist from South Jersey. And I am the host of a podcast, Wine, Women, and Revolution. I've been a green for maybe about six years or so now, I think. Um, you know, I try a fairly common way of formally being a Democrat, realizing that Democrats were not serving the interests of the people and became a green. And I'm really proud of the work that we've been doing since we've been greens here. Um, my activism, I've also been an activist and community organizer. It's around all the things that Madeline and I talk about. We overlap on a lot of this stuff. And especially down here in South Jersey, the, we are a frontline community for climate change. Now, you know, when Madeline asked me to be her lieutenant governor, I thought it was kind of crazy, but we kind of need crazy right now if we want to get things done in time. Our campaign slogan is actually, there's no time to wait because there really is no time to wait. We can't compromise. The Democrats love to compromise, but you can't compromise with the rising tides. You can't compromise with the amount of carbon that we're putting into the air. Who are you compromising with? There's no one that's going to give there. So we really need to fight and we need to fight with drastic things right now. So that's why we are doing things like supporting an eco-socialist Green New Deal. We're really, we know this is a huge mobilization that it's gonna take to do this, but the, there is no option. There is no not doing it if we wanna have a planet we can live on for you know more than a few more decades possibly. Here in South Jersey, we're expecting a recent Rutgers climate survey, another foot of sea level rise by 2050, or just, just hair under a foot of sea level rise. Mm -hmm. 2050 is Governor Murphy's plan of when he wants to get us all fossil fuels in the state. There's already gonna be a foot of sea level rise by then. That's gonna be having a drastic impact on the real people here in New Jersey. Also, one of the things that we talk about a lot in New Jersey is taxes, right? 
people are always saying how high their taxes are. And we actually have real plans for a lot, a lot of what that is, is your education funding. So we want to take that and refund public education on a statewide level. Not only can it provide some property tax relief for people, but it can actually provide true, fair, and equitable education in the state. Because right now, your education is based on what zip code you live in. And that is just not something that's acceptable to Madeline or I in any way, shape, or form. So we talk a lot about equity in our campaign, about justice, about cannabis justice, as Madeline said. I've been a cannabis activist for quite a, few, a while now. And I see that this is just a money grab on the backs of people who have been in this fight for decades and who have had their lives taken away from them. So we definitely are fighting on the forefront of justice, equity, and making New Jersey a really great place to live. Because I enjoy living in New Jersey. We get a lot of jokes about New Jersey and you know we're the butt of a lot of jokes, but really New Jersey is pretty great and it just takes passionate people working really hard. So hopefully people will see the passion that we have for this state and really wanna like what we're saying and elect us on November 2nd. I think you're muted, Howie. Howie, we can't hear you. I think you're muted, Howie. <laughs> I know you're saying something. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was thanking Heather and thanking you, Madeline, and okay. uh, wanted to amplify one of Madeline's points about how insane and uh, unjust the $490,000 qualification to get into debates is mm -hmm. and the election commission you mentioned they administer public campaign financing right correct correct so this is supposed to be the great reform that levels the playing field <laughs> but they set the playing field up so you can't even get into the stadium without paying half a million dollars yep and that was the whole green critique of for the people act where mm -hmm. they were raising the qualifications for primary matching funds five times from the Watergate reform and adding a house uh, public funding uh, system where it takes $50,000 in small contributions to qualify, which to the major parties doesn't sound like a lot, but we went back and looked, there've been over 500 green candidates since 1994 for the house. And we only know of one candidate for sure who would have qualified under that standard. And there are a few others that raised enough money, but you'd have to dig and you know do the counting to see if they had enough small contributions. So, uh, you know, that thing in New Jersey, you know, the, the Democrats will say, "See how progressive we are." No, no. I mean, this is so the major party candidates get public money, and nobody else does. So, that's the whole Green Party beef with this public financing we're getting from the Democratic Party. Of course, the Republicans now say. They don't want it. But you look at the states that have it, like Arizona and mm -hmm. Maine, the Republicans use it. You know, if it's there, they're going to use it. And the honest ones will tell you, you know, I much prefer this than, you know, getting on the phone and begging for money from rich folks. Well, you I know, mean, at, this, at, the same, at the same time, Howie, it just was a report that was released that said in New Jersey, up through these debates, $58 million had been spent on the elections. And of that $58 million and the three uh, independent parties, the Greens had the most. But at the most, at, by the end of this campaign, perhaps we'll spend $12,000. So if you put that $12,000 here, and that's a, good, that's a good year of fundraising, you know, for the $12,000. And you put it against 58 million, you know who loses and who loses big. And this is I, I, every every minute of the so-called debate I watched, I was fuming underneath, just fuming, because these two act as if they own, well, they do own the state or own the country, these two parties. And that's the problem. They own it, they bicker, they don't do anything, they don't hear an alternative point of view. I need to, I want to praise Heather for a second. Um, she was in a debate with independent Lieutenant Governor candidates. I think one of the first of its type in New Jersey, if not the first. And she was the only one putting forward policy. 
Um, and this is this is the the bind we're in. If our voices can't be heard, and I feel like we are being heard, just not on the right stage yet. You know, these two can get away with saying whatever they want to say, promising the world and delivering nothing. You know, and a lot of people may have seen Democracy Now! yesterday, where Larry Ham from the People's Organization for Progress was talking about this march they're doing yes. to get a bill to enable uh, municipalities to have citizen review boards with subpoena power. And he's saying they had a debate last night or this week, and neither candidate was for it. <laughs> but if Madeline had been there, you know, people would have known she was for it. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, it's disappointing that, you know, Larry Hand didn't say, well, there is a candidate, but she wasn't in the debate. Uh, but that's a whole nother question is too many of our progressives have got themselves locked into the Democratic Party where they got no power. That's and right. they just bring in progressives and activists to a situation where they can't win. And uh, we got to replace those people, not just, you know, sort of sit among them in a herd where uh, we get lost in the sauce. Yeah, I've, yeah, I've, that was actually something I talked about in my debate was citizen review boards. That was a platform that I brought up. Citizen review boards with actual teeth that can cause real change. Mm -hmm. But, you know, our it was I kind of referred to it as the kids table debate, where even if the media outlet, the Globe was who hosted it, wanted us to be in the debate with the two big parties, they couldn't let us. Like it's actually against regulations that if they tried to let us in, that it wouldn't be an officially sanctioned debate anymore. So they had to have the kids table debate for the three of us. And of course the viewership is a fraction of what it would it was for the other debate. So they just don't want to hear our solutions because our solutions make everyone else look bad. Well, our solutions are more popular. That's what really scares the Democrats. Yes, I think you're right. <laughs> I know you're right. In fact, we have about uh, between 40 and 60 young people working on our campaign, high school students and college students. And that's where some of our urgency comes from. Obviously, both Heather and I have been activists for a long time. So we have our own passions and we've been driven by our own passions for many years. But the young folks, they look out at this bleak world that we live in right now and they don't see any hope in the two major parties or mainstream parties. They don't see any hope in, in incrementalism a little bit at a time. They say, they say, we don't have time. The changes have to be made now. And so we are, I know I am, and I, I think Heather is too, very um, honored, in fact, to be providing another vehicle, you know, where, where the young people have joined in and write, our op, write some op-ed pieces, go door to door, you know, put out lawn signs, because it's their, it's their world now. It will be their world in 30 years or 40 years. We have to listen to them now, not 30 or 40 years from now, um, you know? And so that's, there's an urgency here. There's a wasteland out there and an urgency in here inside of our campaigns. So let's see if we can get some questions. I've seen some in the, in the comments. Here we go. Good afternoon, Ms. Warburton. Uh, I hope one or both of you will talk about gentrification in the big cities. And if anything can be done about it, just from Amy L. Sachs. Okay. Uh, well, Heather, since you were named, why don't you go? <clears throat> yeah, gentrification is a huge problem in New Jersey. We've seen it in communities like Asbury Park, for example, where all of the residents of the city have practically been pushed out to make room for bars and clubs and, you know, just so wealthier people can have fun, basically. <laughs> and now we're seeing the exact same playbook book being used in Atlantic City. So yes, we have to fight against it. We have to make sure that there is affordable and accessible housing for everyone. And when I say affordable, I mean actually affordable for what people are making. As much as we are trying to bring up the wages, we know what people are making right now and they cannot afford to live in these communities anymore. We need to make sure that the tax burden falls on those who are most able 
to pay taxes. A progressive tax system is something that we are fighting for because we currently have a regressive tax system. So there's a lot of, and also making sure when we're giving sort of tax breaks that we're giving them to the right people, not to these rich mega corporations, not to the casinos in Atlantic City, and that the, the residents of Atlantic City are paying taxes to support the casinos. It should be the opposite of that. So there's a lot of places where we can make real change to fight gentrification. Yeah, and I'll I'll take that, Heather, I'll take that and move it up north to places like Newark, Hoboken, it's been doing this for quite a while, been involved, engaged in gentrification for quite a while. And then uh, other communities in North Jersey that say, hey, let's be like Hoboken, let's, let's gentrify. Um, we have worked with, in the past, grassroots movements in Newark, particularly, to fight against gentrification. I think our policies are necessary. Having somebody in office who will support those policies is necessary, but also going, as Heather mentioned earlier, being out in the streets with people who are fighting. There's a, there's a proposed 23-story high rise for the city of Newark. And you know that that high rise is not going to be for low to moderate income people. It just isn't. So we need to add our voices to the people who are in the streets who are protesting it. Um, and that's what, that's what I've done over the years. That's what we'll continue to do going forward. Um, and then the, others, the other part of the tax system is these, we were looking at, we're, we're gonna have our own state budget to propose in about a week's time. And only 12 to 13% of that budget is paid for by corporate taxes. That's it, just 12 to 13%. And as I recall, going back to the, to the 1950s, that percentage, Hallie, you probably know the exact, more closely what the numbers were, but that number, the percentage of, of um, municipal or state or county federal taxes paid by corporations, the percentage was way higher than 12 to 13%. I'll get you the number here in a second. Uh, I mm -hmm. know it's going down to about 6% at the federal level. Oh, wow. And it, it, it back in the 50s, I think it was around 40%, but I'll get you the number here in a minute. Right. That sounds right. Mm -hmm. Okay. What plans do we have to increase? Well, I mean, I think we're looking at right now, for example, a licensing process regarding um, uh, licenses to dispense uh, uh, cannabis. And um, so we know we, ha we have our eye on it. We've been protesting about the fact that people of color are not have been iced out of or have not yet been granted any licenses to, for, for cannabis dispensaries dispensaries, but that would be the model we would follow in terms of property ownership. Um, we would have to stop redlining. We've also spoken about having a public bank. So, you know, where our money, the money that comes into communities would be invested by people in the communities, not by banks that redline, not by banks that do not give um, mortgages or loans to people of color. So it would all be, it would be about making these processes more transparent um, and monitoring them to make sure that what's hap what happens is actually equal or more equal than it is right now. And if I could just piggyback off that public bank thing, this is something that Governor Murphy promised when he was running for election. And he's a bank guy. Like that's his background is he comes from a financial background. And ever since he got elected, it's been crickets about this public bank. So if he, that's his thing and that's his field that he's in and he didn't even manage to make that happen that shows where his priorities are that's his skill set and he couldn't do that and there's so much justice that can be done with a public bank and also our campaign is the only one that's talking about reparations yes. for indigenous people and people of color mm -hmm. none of the other campaigns are talking about that so we can't say what those reparations necessarily look like because we're two white women you know so but we 
we need to bring in voices from everyone who has had generational wealth robbed from them, who have been redlined, who are descendants of either having their land stolen or being stolen themselves. And part of that definitely could be increasing property ownership and helping people to reclaim that wealth that's been robbed from them for generations. Oof. Okay, um, Andrew Hager asks, what are your ladies' initial thoughts on rebuilding oyster reefs to help prevent sea levels from rising? Um, you want to go first, Heather? I don't have a whole lot of knowledge about oyster reefs and how they prevent sea level rise, but I do know oysters do amazing things for filtering and cleaning the water and stabilizing some infrastructure, like stabilizing the shorelines. But unfortunately, I don't have enough knowledge about how they prevent sea level rise. Yeah, and I would only add to that that when I was teaching environmental science uh, in college, used to talk about the Great Barrier Reef um, of Australia and how due to climate change and human poaching, but mostly climate change, the uh, barrier reef was bleached out. And by bleaching it out, um, it was not, it was completely uh, affecting the ecosystem. And so I would say for, for sure that rebuilding reefs, oyster reefs, other reefs would be something that would be valuable very valuable, but at the same time, I mean, this is one of the lessons we learned from the remnants of Hurricane Ida a short while ago. We need to address the issues of global warming um, by removing ourselves from uh, dependence and reliance on fossil fuels immediately, not by 2050. But we also have to deal with issues of overdevelopment which go to the issue of goes to the issue of gentrification, which we just spoke about, because we're we're building over, paving over places that would have absorbed the rain. So, in these these uh, large rainfalls, so we we have to tackle these problems all different ways, holistically, in order to get at a solution. And uh, I think oyster reefs or rebuilding the reefs would be one part of it. Also, some part of rebuilding sand or the shoreline to keep the erosion, you know, prevent more erosion of the shoreline. But yeah, we would have to turn to some experts to tell us exactly how to do that. Or Andrew could reach out to us <laughs> at our website. If Andrew has That's this knowledge, true. I want to know it. It's more, it's stuff I'd love to learn about. So, you know, you can find it. You know, somebody just put up our website there, hoffmanforgovnj.com or any of the social medias. You can reach out, Andrew, and say, hey, I'm Andrew from the live stream. And this is what I know about oysters. And we can incorporate that. Most of our platforms come from other really smart people. So I'd love to incorporate some of that into our platform. Yeah. Uh, before I read this question, I, I got some information, not what I, exactly what I was looking for, about uh, corporate taxes at the federal level. Mm -hmm. um, back in the 50s, it, it uh, took in 6% of national income, or GDP, basically the same thing. Uh, today, it's 1%. Mm. And the corporate tax rate from the 40s to the 70s bounced around 50%. You know, some years of 52, some years of 48 but around 50%. Today it's 21%. Mm. And that's not what it really is. The effective rate is, you know, getting down around 10% because there's so many uh, tax breaks and loopholes. Yes. And we know about a lot of these big corporations not paying any taxes in many years. So, um, but I, I wrote a paper on taxes that I'm still working on and I thought I had that number in there, but I don't, you know, percentage of the federal budget that corporate taxes pay for. So now I know something else I need to do to finish that. Uh, so well, there, there, yeah. go ahead. Oh, Howie, sorry. Yeah, I was going to read the next question. All right. Well, well I, I would just add the one thing that we know that people have seen at a local level is that when corporations pay less in taxes at any level, local, county, or state, 
they then stand around almost like vultures. And when the municipality or the county or the state says, we don't have enough money to cover that essential service, the corporations come in and say, well, we'll provide it, but we'll provide it at a cost and we'll make a profit. So it's just part of the vicious cycle we've been in since the 1950s. So Scout Trooper 164 asks Hoffman and Warburton, would you allow abandoned buildings of any kind to be renovated to allow people to find homes or have proper ownage of the property? Short answer is yes. Yeah, I think there's a lot of use that we could use public domain, um, you know, that we can um, take these abandoned buildings with deadbeat landlords that are actually like harming the community and allow people to ho be homed in these buildings. And if there's some sort of like co-op or whatever that allows them to have ownership and to have, you know, sort of that generational wealth that we're talking about that's been robbed from people through redlining, then using, or eminent domain, sorry, I said public domain, eminent domain to take these abandoned buildings and actually make them useful instead of danger to the community. Like just recently, um, the Trump Plaza had to be demolished in uh, Atlantic City. <laughs> and there's actually a video of Madeline standing in like the ruins mm -hmm. of the Trump Plaza. We did a TikTok video there of that. I don't that. think we ever retrieved that. You remind <laughs> me, Heather. I gotta, oh, okay. I gotta find that um, one. You know, so you see, and like there are parts of this building that were falling off and hurting people walking by because that's what deadbeat landlords cause. And if we could have taken all of these abandoned buildings and actually made people have homes in them, it's a great way to fight gentrification. Mm -hmm. And it's also just beneficial for people. Well, speaking of eminent domain, uh, you heard about this referendum they did in Berlin, Germany, where Not sure. the people voted to take over 200,000 occupied units owned by big landlords and have and make them part of their public housing system. That's right. And mm -hmm. We got a bigger problem in Germany in that regard because we got BlackRock and these other big, big hedge funds since the Great Recession. All these properties went up on the market and they bought them up and they come in and they pay cash faster than a regular person can get a mortgage and get all that paperwork done. They just come in. Here's cash. The seller takes the cash. So we got these Wall Street landlords now who are jacking up the rents. And that explains why we have such homelessness. And now that the eviction moratorium is up, we're going to have a lot more. So uh, mm -hmm. I think, yes, we should uh, utilize abandoned properties. But I think some of these monopoly landlords, we oh, should yeah. take oh, them yeah. over by eminent domain in the public interest. Like now this referendum in Germany was just advisory. It mm -hmm. wasn't binding. So the government, which is social democratic and green, has a choice. And we'll see if they take on the landlords. Well, so got, that's another policy option we've got. Every time we have a rally in the city of Newark, uh, we since January 6th, in fact, we've been having anti-war rallies in Newark of one sort and an, of another or another and talking about how all the money that's being spent on the military could be used, better used here at home. Um, including, you know, for pro programs or, uh, like this one, policies or programs like this one. Every time we've been out in Newark in January, we had people come up to us who were sleeping in Penn Station and shivering like crazy because they didn't have a hat. They didn't have the proper clothes. We go by now and as we went and moved into the summer, people are sleeping on the sidewalks. I mean, these, this is totally unacceptable totally unacceptable. And so any way we can get at uh, addressing that problem, including including freeing up billions of dollars from the military budget, this is what we need to do. And I know the military budget is a federal, federal issue, but we, Heather and I, would fight and lobby and, and twist arms of our, our congressional delegation to vote in favor of Things like even a, a measly 10% cut to the military budget, which didn't go through uh, about a week or so ago.
uh, Josu, and I may have pronounced that wrong, Josue Gonzalez. Mm -hmm. uh, stack question, Madeline Hoffman for governor. Will you ever close down a beach the way Chris Christie did when governor? <laughs> <laughs> oh well i mean okay now i've got real sun in my we're talking about beaches and i've got the sun in my eyes um uh i wouldn't do it the way he did it um specifically i wouldn't shut it down and then uh sit on the beach in my lounge chair and say look at me you know you may not be able to enjoy the beach but i can um and i also i mean there are reasons to there are reasons to close down beaches, you know, if they're, if they, but, but the other thing that I would do even before talking about that is I would make more of our beaches free. I mean, we, we have beautiful beaches in New Jersey and you have to pay to go to most of them. So I'd make the beaches free. Um, and if we needed to shut down a beach, it would be for everyone, including myself and Heather as governor and lieutenant governor. That was one of the most shocking things when I moved to New Jersey was learning about beach tags. This was not something we had in Delaware, where basically you have to buy like a little badge to be able to go to the beaches, at least here in South Jersey. I don't know if that's a North Jersey thing, yeah. Yeah. but a lot of the beaches, you've got to buy these little tags to be allowed on the beaches. It was the craziest thing. Like, just, you know, the beach should belong to everyone. It's a great place. It's a beautiful place. Why do you have to buy something that says that you can go to the beach? It's crazy. Yeah. And I, it's, it's public prop. It should be public. It should be enjoyed by the public. Um, I was in Colombia this summer and I was at uh, Port City, uh, Buena Ventura is what it's called. Uh, and there were some homes of people who had been living off the livelihood of the ocean, fishermen and women, uh, for many, many years. And was sitting on the front porch uh, right alongside of the ocean. And I could basically, if I wanted to, put my hands into the ocean. Um, and I said, when I was sitting there, I said, this is the way, this is the way it needs to be. You know, this is a public good. It's part of our environment. We shouldn't be barred from or, or separated from it. And you know that on top of that, the government, it's, I know this is not New Jersey business, but it's similar in some ways. The government was wanting to displace all the people who lived there. Um, and build a gold coastline, like with hotels and casinos and other such things. And, you know, that was not, that was not something that I thought was appropriate. But the main thing is just sitting on the ocean, at the ocean, watching the sunset, watching people come in and out, fisher, fisher people, and saying that's the way it should be. A. Jones 35 asks, do you recognize sex work is work? I'm going to ask you to answer that question first, Heather. Yes, sex work is work. Sex workers deserve all the protections. Workers should have more protections across the board, but sex workers deserve every protection that workers get. They should be able to unionize. They should be able to get, you know, fair labor high, you know, practices. They should have every right that workers should have and all workers across the board should have way more protections than they do. And I couldn't agree with Heather anymore. If, you know, I, I agree with her completely, um, but I know she has worked more on that particular issue than I have specifically, but yes, sex work is work. And I agree with everything she said. Hobby Girl asks, are Greens pro-nuclear power? I have my reservations, but my son said they are more advanced and clean. I'll let you guys go first, but I'm going to wait. <laughs> no, uh, we are not pro-nuclear power. Um, one of the big problems with nuclear power, in fact, somebody just asked me this the, uh, today because we we're talking about the need to get off of fossil fuels. So they're saying, well, why not nuclear power? And the, the, why not nuclear power? The big reason, two, two main reasons. The cooling water is going in and out of, you know, the 
whatever water the the nuclear power plant is built alongside that's one and two uh, and and the effect of heating up that 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 hotter water warmer water going in to the river or the the waterway and the effect that has on the ecosystem and the second part which is something that has never been resolved and probably never will be is where to put the spent fuel rods and how to deal with those whose radiation lasts forever and ever and ever. The half-lives is very long. The half-life is very long. And inevitably, where do, the, where do authorities put that waste? On top of Native American lands, on top of indigenous lands. So it creates another disposal. It creates a disposal nightmare. And it's not, it's not uh, clean and it's, and it creates a disposal nightmare. So no, um, greens are not pro nuclear power. You want to weigh in Heather? <clears throat> um, sure. And I would say, I think there is a little bit of, um, false hysteria about nuclear power that makes it seem like coal and fossil fuels are not dangerous. They're both dangerous mm. and they both have the, what we're talking about with heating and cooling the water and things like that. So I would not say nuclear power is the solution we're going for. We should be talking about renewables, right? right. Renewables and things that are clean and we need to invest more money in renewables. We're investing tons of money into nuclear power, especially here in New Jersey to keep nuclear plants open when really that money should be going into renewables and things that are safe and clean and actually in no way, shape or form harmful. But I'd like to, you know, I, that is one of my biases that we know, we talk about how bad nuclear is, but fossil fuel is, it's polluting, it's dangerous, it's damaging. And also those leftover products also end up in marginalized communities as well. That's so true. they're all bad, get rid of them all, work <laughs> on clean, safe energy. Well, I just want to say this. Nuclear power keeps coming up uh, because the nuclear industry, with the support of the Obama administration and now the Biden administration, because there are nuclear subsidies in mm. Build Back Better, uh, they would have been included in that clean energy performance program I was talking about. Uh, mm. You know, they keep pushing it. And nuclear power is the most unsuccessful industrial uh, industry in the probably the history of, <coughs> of industrialization, certainly since World War II. Mm. They cannot exist without subsidies. They are economically unviable. Mm. They are, you know, the companies that own them want to shut them down because they're losing money. And in states like my state, New York and Ohio, subsidize them so they can say they got carbon-free nuclear power, which isn't true. A lot of carbon is spent, is emitted, you know, mining, milling, mm. transporting, uh, and when the nukes are shut down for refueling or because there's some problem, they have diesel generators to provide electricity to the to the nuclear facility. So they're not completely uh, nuclear free. They're dirty. Hundreds of thousands of years, the waste has to be stored. They are dangerous. Chernobyl, Fukushima, those are disasters. Yes. And then you get, and I saw this in the chat, well, what about the advanced nuclear? the thorium reactors, the modular reactors. And that's another damn lie. Hmm. They were working on thorium reactors in the 40s and they didn't go forward with them because they were less uh, successful than the light water reactors they did go forward with. And modular nukes, they're just smaller, which means you don't get economies of scale, which means they have to be subsidized even more. <laughs> Nuclear is crazy. Hmm. Uh, the Obama Biden administration provided loan guarantees to build up to about a dozen nukes. And most utilities are smart enough not to even try. But one did in South Carolina try to build two nukes. And after spending billions more than they were budgeted, they gave up, shut them down, and mm -hmm. cost overruns and construction delays. The only two nukes they're still working on are the nukes at uh, Vogel in Georgia, where the budget has gone from about 12 billion to 27 billion, and they're years and years over, uh, you know, schedule behind schedule, and they're only throwing money in there because Brian Kemp beat Stacey Abrams to be the governor, probably by fraudulent means, 
Hmm. So that's just a boondoggle. And Kemp is a creature of uh, Georgia Power and the Southern Company. So they're corrupt. The subsidies hmm. in Ohio, the Speaker of the Ohio House got bribes from the nuclear industry to get the subsidies passed. I mean, so I could go on. <laughs> and I've been fighting nukes since the 70s. But uh, I, uh, I just kind of upset that people are falling for this nonsense. Nuclear industry is a failure. And we don't have time to mess around building nukes that may never work when we could build solar and wind now, which is the cheapest form of energy there is now. The prices of solar and wind are cheaper than coal, oil, gas, and certainly nukes. Okay, I'm sorry. I took too long. But... <laughs> oh, thank you. So since he asked, will you ban standardized testing in schools if elected? Um, I would say yes. Um, I would because the standardized tests are biased um, in many cases. The standardized tests do not adequately show or accurately show um, what students are capable of doing and what they're not capable of doing, especially if you factor in the cultural bias. And I think education has to be less of a cookie cutter kind of thing where everybody fits into these little molds that are designed you know, to this is what the teacher has to teach you because you have to be ready for the test. I think education is much, much more than that and has to be individualized with students having an opportunity to learn about the things that interest them, that catch their, catch their passion and their creativity. So, yes, I would ban standardized testing in schools if elected. 100%. I agree with that. Um, we know that standardized testings are racist. There's a racial bias in standardized testings. And this is another way to rob marginalized communities of resources. Because then, oh, well, they have low testing scores. So we don't pay teachers as well in places that have low testing scores. And we don't give the resources to these schools with low testing scores. And it's all just a way of taking money out of marginalized communities and distributing it to other communities. So absolutely get rid of the standardized tests. Children are individual. They're not numbers on a sheet that you can add up and subtract and you know do equations with. Every child's metric of success is different and we need to recognize that. Green Party of New Jersey. Oh. Your own people say, should New Jersey continue to do business with the state of Israel? Will, uh, why is Phil Murphy, he's the current governor, trying to divest money from Unilever? Well, this is, this is near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, Heather had mentioned this earlier. Uh, ben and Jerry's decided that they were not going to sell their popular ice cream in the occupied territories. Um, in Israel, uh, occupied Palestinian, the occupied territories of Palestine, and the New Jersey has a bill which I had opposed back in 2016, along with many others. We were in the streets opposing this bill that would make it legal for state officials to basically work their way into corporate boardrooms, and if somebody in that corporation decided that they wanted to participate in a boycott of the state of Israel, then the state of New Jersey had the right to go in and penalize them, punish them. And in this case, Unilever is the parent company of Ben and Jerry's, and the state is threatening to divest $182 million of pension funds from Unilever because of the actions of, of Ben and Jerry's. And I say no. Uh, I've been saying no. I can will continue to say no. The people in Palestine are victims of apartheid and a brutal occupation. And anything at this point that can be done, this is a nonviolent boycotts. Boycotts have been, you know, we've been using boycotts in this country for many years. So to cut off even the uh, ability of people to boycott selling their products or buying products. To me, that's it's outrageous. And as the governor, I would absolutely not do it. I mean, I would not divest money from Unilever for that reason. 
yeah, the fact that you can be penalized for participating in a boycott in New Jersey is outrageous. And people have a right to boycott. That is a you know, one of the easiest tools at our disposal to express our displeasure with things. You know, there's a lot of companies that I personally don't purchase from. And, you know, the fact that the state is divesting because Ben and Jerry's made a choice to not sell ice cream in occupied Palestinian territory is really dangerous and does not accurately represent all of the people of New Jersey, I don't think. It's dangerous, and we believe it also to be unconstitutional, um, for whatever that's worth, the Constitution. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I agree with everything you said, Heather, and I would just add that it's also unconstitutional. Well, we're at an hour, um, and no more questions have popped up. So. Madeline and, and Heather, uh, would you like to uh, sum up and, and give people your last thoughts? Sure. Um, Howie, uh, I thank you so much for having Heather and me on your show today and giving us an opportunity to interact with your audience on a whole variety of really important issues. This is something that... Um, I'm very passionate about talking to people, answering people's questions. We're doing that in the state of New Jersey for the last two weeks or two and almost three weeks until the elections. We urge people to uh, visit our website, which, uh, which was on the screen, and um, I'm sure we'll get back up on the screen. There we go. Um, we, are, we are targeting advertising through Facebook. We are we are getting up lawn signs all over the state. We are helping students do mock elections in their high schools. We need your support. So a $5 donation, a $10 donation will help us get our, our message out um, and help us uh, as we go down the last, uh, get through the last couple of weeks before the election. And we want to build, we got almost 40,000, I did almost 40,000 votes last cycle when I ran for U.S. Senate. We want to build the Green Party. We want to build off that number because we think that the Green Party is really necessary um, in order to change the way this country or and also the way the state conducts itself. I'll just add that you can also reach us on all the social medias. We have Facebook, we have Twitter, we have Instagram, we even have a TikTok. So you can reach out to us across all the different social medias. You don't have to be in New Jersey to get active in our campaign. We only have about 17 days left, but you can phone bank for us. You yes. can share our stuff around. That's a huge help, sharing our posts and our social media posts and our statements on things. And, you know, just engaging with people. If you're not in New Jersey, do you know someone from New Jersey, call them and tell them, you know, this is an important election right now. And, you know, we can make a real change here in New Jersey. We can really fight for important issues. And we just need our voices to keep getting amplified. Well, thank you, Heather. And thank you, Madeline, for uh, sharing your thoughts. Um, we could have gone on a lot longer. I keep thinking, a lot of people, when they think of New Jersey politics, they think corruption. <laughs> You know, and New York, Illinois, and Louisiana may compete with New Jersey, but it's a huge issue. But yes. you know what's a bigger issue is not the and you wonder why people go to illegal corruption when there's so much legalized corruption, mm. legalized bribery. Mm -hmm. That's what private campaign financing is. And in New Jersey, they add public money to the legalized bribery. It's incredible. It is. And then, and then you look at what's going on in Congress, uh They've got just enough Democrats, three members of the House, and Kirsten Sinema in Arizona to say, we don't want Medicare to bargain with Big Pharma over drug prices, which is wildly popular with the American people. That, those are bribes those politicians are getting. They're getting flooded with money from the insurance companies and the drug companies. And so we got as much corruption that's legal as illegal. So I think, you know, that's a huge issue that we've got to address. And, uh, you know, 
the Democrats pushed forward this public campaign financing. But if you actually look at it, it's really money for them and certainly not for us as Greens. Let me add just something real quick, Howie, because because you you reminded me our campaign is good. The good party certified. Uh, the good party is not a political party. It's software and it certifies people who are anti-corruption and politically independent. And if you go to the good party website, good party, um, you can find us listed and you can endorse us real quickly with a check. And you can then you can send that to people, you know. So it's we are definitely in that same in the very same um, business as you, Howie. I don't like to use the word business, but we're in the same. We're we're trying to keep corruption out, and we've been certified as as doing that, doing just that. Well, there's business and there's business. Busyness. <laughs> we're busy, you know, fighting for peace, right, and the environment, and economic justice. So. Uh, I don't mind calling that our business, but um, I guess I'll just say one last point. Well, two. One is I saw in the chat somebody said, why can't I register in the Green Party in Nebraska? And every state is different. You're, in most states, and first of all, 23 states don't have registration mm -hmm. in parties. And I don't know if Nebraska is one of those states or not. I don't have them all memorized. But in the other 27, uh, you got to have a ballot line. And then the state will let you register uh, for primaries that are closed or semi-closed. That's usually why they take registration. And all the state cares is they want to know what primary to give, you know, what ballot to give you. Um, so in Nebraska, we don't have a ballot line at present. The, the questioner said they did have one in 2016. Yeah, they did. Get, we did get on a ballot in 2016. We didn't in 2020. So what we got to do, and every state is different, has different rules. We lost our ballot line in New York, where I am. New York now has the hardest ballot access law mm -hmm. in the country. We got to get 45,000 signatures in 42 days, including a distribution requirement of 500 signatures in half the congressional districts. That's a five-fold increase of the previous requirement. Um, I don't know if we can do it. We're going to try. So, and then you compare this country to other countries. Mm -hmm. we, we, we're off the charts in terms of how hard it is to get on the ballot. I've told this to people before. I'll just do a brief version of it. You want to get on a ballot run for Congress in most states, it takes thousands or tens of thousands of signatures to run as an independent or minor party candidate. You want to do it in the UK to run for the House of Commons, it's 10 signatures. In Canada, it's 100. Here, it's thousands or tens of thousands. So that's just another reason why, you know, this mantra that you hear in the mainstream media, our great democracy, no, it's not so great. They set up the Helsinki Accords to go after political repression in the Soviet bloc back in the 70s. Now that same organization, it's the U.S. that is the target of audit criticism because our electoral system is so messed up. So anyway, that was one point. The other is you're going to hear about a lot about uh, Build Back Better and particularly the Glasgow Climate Summit in the October 31st and November 12th being our last chance to save the planet. Look. It's not the last chance. Wherever we are, we can always do something. Um, and we're not going to get what we want from Build Back Better or out of Glasgow. So I, I just am objecting to calling this the last chance because then people are going to say, well, we didn't get what we need. I give up. Mm -hmm. There's nothing I can do. It'll demoralize people. We got to prepare people for a sustained struggle to deal with the climate emergency and the economic emergency that is related to it. So I guess that's my point. Don't don't believe the hype about this being the last chance. We're late as it is, no doubt. But after the climate summit, after Build Back Better, whatever it is comes out, uh, our work is not done. So I hope everybody's in it for the long haul. And once again, thanks, Madeline and Heather, for coming on. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>